So this is the, uh, the February um, installment of the monthly, our monthly seminar series for Johns Hopkins Global Center on Childhood Obesity. So we're fortunate to have uh, Bill Wheaton here to speak. He's the Director of Geospatial Science Technology at RTI, where he's been there for about 20 years. Um, so Bill and I have uh, been collaborators, colleagues, and friends for about seven years going. Um, he originally was a geography major at uh, Dartmouth, and uh, amazingly, he actually, his career actually emerged and continued what he actually majored in in college, which I think is a rarity. Um, he was previously at uh, Esri in Southern California, and then ultimately uh, moved to RTI. Um, through working with him, I've really learned the, uh, the power of the work that he does. Uh, so he, as I mentioned, focuses on uh, various geospatial methods. Uh, he describes himself as a journalist uh, in terms of content because um, his group applies geospatial technology and methods to many different diseases, <laughs> uh, ranging from chronic diseases to acute infectious diseases. Uh, our initial um, connection with each other came through the world of infectious diseases where uh, we together built uh, influenza models and worked on healthcare associated infections. Uh, so, and uh, that made a lot of use of his uh, synthetic populations, which he's going to talk about today. So without further ado, we're, we're fortunate to have Bill joining us from North Carolina, and uh, he'll be talking about synthetic populations and, and some of those geospatial approaches that uh, I mentioned. So thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Bruce, and thanks for the invitation to present. Appreciate it. Um, just a brief word about RTI. Uh, RTI is a nonprofit uh, private research company in North Carolina, so we're uh, a pretty broadly based uh, research organization. Uh, not exactly academic, not exactly for profit, so we fit in the middle there and uh, enjoy working with academic uh, research institutions like Johns Hopkins, and uh, so we've uh, appreciated the collaboration here. So uh, I'll be uh, talking about synthetic populations, and. Uh, a little bit about the creation of them and uh, probably more about the use of them um, uh, in different uh, application areas, both system science and uh, just for other analytical geographical uh, uses. So um, first of all, the concepts, uh, what are they, where do we get them, why do we create them, uh, how do we create them? Some of the geographical aspects, I was a geographer, that's what I'm very much interested in. Other people who deal with synthetic populations uh, create them in a, in a way that is non-spatial, it's just lists uh, and tables of information. But as a geographer, I want to know where these synthetic households are, so that's one of the keys that uh, we look at with synthetic populations. And then some of the uh, application areas in system science and others. So what is it? First of all, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but uh, I like to say that it's, it's a computerized representation of households and individuals that reflect the statistics, geography, and behavior of real populations. We don't just make this stuff up out of thin air. We use census data to generate these synthetic populations, but they're de-identified, so they're totally public use. There's no restriction to using them at all. Um, and they represent reality pretty well. It's not an exact representation, but it's pretty good. Um, and fundamentally, synthetic populations are microdata. And so macrodata, you might consider like uh, estimates by an area. It's a summary of information by an area. Whereas microdata is individual records for individual entities, <coughs> okay? In our case, mostly it's households and people. But they can be other things as well. Some people generate synthetic populations of uh, poultry farms to analyze uh, uh, avian influenza in the poultry industry. People are developing malaria models where they're actually simulating the behavior of every insect or every mosquito. That's a microdata uh, population. But we'll stick mainly to uh, human populations for the presentation here. So why do we need to create these things? Um, we don't have a list of everybody in this room with your age and gender and race and income. It doesn't exist. The census, even the census that collects basic information on how many people there are in the 
in the country doesn't collect data on uh, educational attainment. That's the American Community Survey collects that. The census doesn't. So uh, a lot of the, the data that we have is summarized data from the ACS at an aggregated level. So we don't have this list, even though there are things like mailing lists and direct marketing. You know, you get mail that says resident of such and such an address. So people know where everybody lives. And they may know your name, but they don't know some of these characteristics about you. And so we generate these data sets to have a good representation of the social and demographic characteristics. In this quote, uh, I like a lot from uh, uh, Balas. Uh, he says, if we do not have a micro database on individuals and households, then we have to simulate one so that we can do uh, soci social models of the entire population. So uh, a primary use of synthetic populations are as agents in agent-based models. And uh, the classic use is in SEIR models, uh, susceptible, uh, exposed, infectious, and um, recovered uh, models that uh, are often used in influenza and, and other diseases like that. And in a model like this, every person is simulated and uh, every household. And so if I catch flu, it's more likely that uh, I will transmit that flu to somebody in my household or somebody I may work with or go to school with than it is for me to randomly transmit it to somebody um, uh, at the mall or something like that. So within these models, it's possible to develop experiments that determine what might happen under different scenarios. So if we have a highly infectious uh, novel influenza and we close schools to try to reduce the, the uh, the transmission, what effect does that school closure really have on transmission? So those are the questions that you can uh, ask and try to answer with uh, agent-based models. And uh, a lot of work has been done uh, uh, in this area with uh, using synthetic populations. And I'm just going to show a movie here of uh, the output of one of these models. This is for Pennsylvania. and. Uh, it shows over about 180 days the uh, assimilation of influenza infection across Pennsylvania. It starts in the eastern part of the uh, state, and then um, it's going to start again here in a second. And the yellow to red gradation is the percent of people who are ill with uh, the flu. And they rise up as it increases, and they shrink down as the uh, epidemic uh, runs its course. So this is the then output from a model that shows the disease transmission. So this is one of the fundamental uses of synthetic populations and will always be one of the key uh, things that they are, uh, are used for. But there are other uses as well that we're going to uh, look at here. Now what does the synthetic population look like? It really is two things. It's, a, it's, it's geospatial data to me, and so there's a location assigned to every household. And there's information about each household. So we have a record for every household in one table. And then there's a record for every person in each household. So we have that linkage between persons and households, which is very important for uh, a lot of uh, different analyses. For, for uh, infectious disease, it's contact patterns. You're more likely to transmit within a household because you have a lot of contact there. It also has a very important role in other behaviors. Uh, uh, so if, you're, if your parents do something, and your children are going to be likely to do uh, the same sort of thing. Um, so it's very, very simple in a conceptual way. There are dots on a map, and there are tables that link the dots to uh, characteristics of the households and the persons. Now, the primary source of data for the synthetic population that we've generated are RTI. And there are other methods, and there are other people who uh, develop these and have other sources. But what we use is the American Community Survey. And this is a survey that is always in the field by the Census Bureau. They're collecting data all the time. And they publish uh, results of this survey uh, at one year, three year, and five year intervals. We use the five year ACS because it is it provides uh, estimates of uh, characteristic of the population at block group levels, which is a fairly precise geographic unit. And there are two key products that uh, result from the ACS that we use. One is the counts by unit of geography, so how many 
households with uh, fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars in income are there in an area? How many uh, people who have a college education are there in a certain area? So aggregated counts, macro data at, at a block group level. And then we use a second data set that is provided by the ACS called the Public Use Microdata Sample, or PUMS. And we use a 5% uh, uh, version of that data. This data set has actual responses from the ACS. So uh, I think it's maybe one in 15 households get the ACS. I don't know if that's within five years or one year, I'm not sure. But anyway, everybody in this room by now should have received this ACS survey at least once and filled it out. And um, it has all kinds of questions about the household and the people in the household. And so 5% of those responses are available in this PUMS data. So we'll look very briefly at these two different kinds of data. The ACS summary data will have information like this. How many households, or it could be people depending on the characteristic, how many households are there in these different income categories? So this might be a block group with 199 total households, and this is how they break down in terms of uh, income. So there's, there's hundreds, actually thousands of tables that ACS produces with all these kinds of different counts by different uh, covariates and so on. The other data source that I mentioned is the PUMS data, which is the microdata. This is a record on the top here for each household, okay, in the sample. And the bottom is the records for the people. And there's a link between each record on the bottom to the household it is in, in the top. And this is de-identified. So even though it's data that was actually filled out by people and uh, you know, provided in, mostly in its entirety, uh, it's not provided at a geographic level or with any identifying information about address or name or any of that thing, sort of thing. So it's de-identified, it's publicly available. So we're going to take this 5% sample and we're going to generate a 100% set of households from it. And the way we do that is using something called IPF or uh, iterative proportional fitting, also known as raking in, in some st statistical packages. And we're not going to go through a lot of detail on this, but basically the idea is that for a particular block group, uh, if we look at household or age by these age categories, we know how many households are in a block group for each category. So there's four households in the 15 to 24 year old category, uh, 134 in the 25 to 34, and so on. We know the marginals. We also know are the things about this uh, block group, how many workers are in each uh, household. So there's zero, one, two, or more than two. And again, we get a count for the block group. So there's 360 households total, either across or down. But what we don't know is how many 15 to 24 households there are who also have two people who work. And so we have to estimate that using this IPF process. So we calculate these uh, probabilities, and then we use these to select from the public use microdata so that we get the correct set of households to fill in this these combinations of households. And we're actually using four different uh, variables simultaneously. So uh, the income of the household, the age of the householder, the size of the number of occupants, and the race of the householder. We have to make a couple of assumptions on race. One key one is that everything we're doing here is we're selecting households. And whatever people are in those households, they come along for the ride. So how do, we, how do we select based on race? Well, we assume that the head of the household or the person who filled out the form, their race uh, is the same race as everybody in that household. Not entirely true all the time, but that's an assumption we make uh, based on households. So we're simultaneously trying to select a set of households for a block group where accounts of all of these things are correct in a block group. So we take the summary data, so we know how many things how many households of each type we should get. Uh, we've got the 5% microdata, which provides us a sample of households that have those criteria. We uh, do the IPF to uh, figure out which of these 5% households we should select for each block group. They're all different. And then that results in this 100% set of household uh, synthesized data. So again, this is why we it, it's synthesized, but it's, it's real. There's a real 
uh, microdata from the ACS that people filled out. Then, once we have all these lists of households and their characteristics, uh, we place them on the map. And so, in this uh, slide here, the yellow uh, uh, polygon here is a single census block group. And uh, we place the households, the red dots here, based on another data set called the LandScan data set that is a 90 meter estimate of how many people live every 90 meters across the whole country. And the key thing here is that this part of the census block group, there, nobody lives there. It's a mall, okay? And so we don't place any households there. We place the households where there are um, actual houses. We don't try to map them precisely on household tops, A, because it's very, very difficult to do, and B, we don't want to because then it's getting a little too much like uh, identifiable data even though it would just be a total coincidence if the synthetic household we put on a particular house matched who actually lived there. But it's close enough for uh, modeling and uh, analysis applications. And this idea that, that the population is distributed in space in a heterogeneous way, in other words, it's clustered, is important for some of the mapping things I'll talk about later. Once you've done all that, you get a data set like this. So this is the LA Basin. I don't know, there's five million or eight million dots here. Um, each of these four maps is one of the four variables in the uh, uh, synthetic population. So this one up here is household size. Blue is smaller households, one and two person households. Oranges and reds, these are households that have more people in them. Definitely patterns here. Uh, this is household income. Yellow is lower income. Blue is higher income. Up in Malibu and around the mountains, you have higher income. Down in some of the coastal areas, higher income. I think it's interesting in this map that the blue follows the perimeter of this whole area pretty well. I think there's a paper on the morphological structure of income in L.A. just from that right there. Uh, this is householder age. So blues are younger. Reds are older. And then this is household race. Uh, red is white. This uh, green color is African American, and purple is uh, Asian. Um, in each one of these maps, it's the same dots. They're just color coded by a different characteristic. It's not different dots in each map. Uh, in terms of accuracy, we, we do some uh, work to try to figure out how close we came. You know, ACS says this is what you should have in this block group. And so uh, we compare what we came up with to what the ACS estimates. And this is just an example of one of those graphs. Uh, it, when you get to very kind of unusual households, like seven or more household, seven or more uh, households of seven or more people, sometimes this graph will get a little more, a little more speckly. But uh, for most of them, it's a very good match where you expect uh, the, each, each one of these dots is a, is a census block group. And you would expect what the ACS estimates, it should be the same as what the synthetic population got. And so usually it's pretty close like this. It can't be exact, though. And then this map just shows spatially how those comparisons look. We wanted to make sure that the errors that or in the data weren't clustered in urban areas or rural areas. So we did some mapping like this. The uh, uh, orange and, and red colors here are where places where we had more synthetic households in a particular category than ACS. And the blues are where we had fewer. And these percentages here are the worst is 8% off, um, uh, either high or low. These are block groups, census tracts when you aggregate up. Some of that error kind of gets aggregated out, so you have less error. And then at counties, everything is within 3%, every county. OK, now I want to change subjects here and talk a little bit about uh, what I call the tyranny of polygons. This is a little uh, inside baseball for the geographer, but um, uh, I think it's going to be important to cover this. Polygon maps. We see them all the time. State maps, county maps, zip code maps, they're all over the web, they're all over your textbooks, they're everywhere. These are otherwise known as choropleth maps um, or thematic maps. Choropleth, choro is uh, the Greek root for color, so a color-coded map. Uh, these are census block groups in uh, Baltimore. And the issue is that, first of all, uh, when we look at a map like this, we assume that everything within each polygon is heterogeneous. So if we look at a population map, we assume that 
everybody is speckled around there uh, all randomly. It's not the case. And the other thing about it is that who decided that these should be the areas that we summarize data on? The Census Bureau made these, and this is how they collect their data. So, okay, that's a good reason to use census block groups to summarize census data. But you can summarize data at any geographic level and get different answers based on how you aggregate it. So here's a map of uh, just population, straight counts. Um, there's an equal number of uh, yellow polygons, an equal number of green ones, and an equal number of blue ones. Um, so one of the things here that we'll see over and over is that areas that, have, uh, that are very large uh, kind of overwhelm the map just because they're large, not because there's a lot of people there. Um, if we go ahead and take uh, population density, so we divide the count of people by the area, uh, then we get a, a different map and uh, we can start to see how, how the, the uh, size of the polygon versus the population varies. So this is a potentially more useful map. Um, but then let's look at something like uh, crime. Okay, so here's a map of crime rates for 2012 based on block groups where we count up each crime incident, summarize it by block groups. And again, every uh, color is represented by the same number of block groups, so the same number of observations in each category. But what you see in this map is that down in the southeast part of the map, there seems to be a huge crime issue. These are the high crime areas. Uh, the reason it looks that way is because these are big polygons, not because there's a lot of crime there, because there's not a lot of people there, okay? So uh, if we make that map the way it really ought to be made, we have something called a cartogram here. And each polygon here is now resized based on the count of people in the polygon. So now you see more of a pattern where uh, you get the same amount of the area in yellows and oranges and reds. And these areas down in the southeast part, they almost disappear because even though there's higher crime there as a rate, there's only a few households in some of those census block groups. So it's really not maybe uh, an issue of, of, uh, of a huge importance. So this is what I call the tyranny of polygons. One aspect of it is that a polygon choropleth map is misleading because the size of the polygon influences the perception of the map, okay? And uh, that all is part of uh, how to lie with maps. I mean, you may not be lying, but you can mislead easily. And uh, this, this is a real book. You've all heard of How to Lie with Statistics, I'm sure. Well, How to Lie with Maps is, uh, is also a book out there. And the point is that the map maker is, is telling a story. And uh, so even though it's based on data, they can do things that will make their message be, uh, uh, that the message will be what they want it to be uh, uh, in terms of the uh, subtleties of how they create the map. Now the other issue with polygons is uh, what's called the modifiable area unit problem. And uh, this is the idea that, and I'll just read the quote here, it's short. Uh, aerial units or zonal objects like census block groups used in many geographical studies are arbitrary, modifiable, and subject to the whims and fancies of whoever is doing or did the aggregating. This is a, a classic problem in geography. Depending on how I develop my zones, I get different answers. So let's look at that problem. So here's a, a small piece of Baltimore. Uh, it's the percent uh, population that's uh, black and uh, it's based on the census block groups, okay, based on the way the census calculates uh, and uh, collects the data. And so you get, you know, you get what you get, and you, there is a pattern here for sure, but part of that is based on how they define the polygons. So if we just take some arbitrary polygons, just like these boxes, and we overlay them onto the actual locations of the households, because no matter how the Census Bureau collects the census data, those households are, are there. I mean, they're in reality there. Um, and so if we map those and then we just place some boxes over them and we calculate the percent of white dots uh, in each box, we get 80% in the upper left, 5%, 93%, and 16%. Well, what if we decided to uh, summarize the data uh, with only two areas? So we take those four blocks, 
and now we just make two of them, top and bottom. Well, we get now a much more kind of 24%, 39%. It's a much more integrated area. Okay, well, that's encouraging. Well, what if we split the boxes the other way? Now we get 88% in the left area and 12% in the right area. So it's all totally based on the summary units you're using. So the issue is, if you don't have the dots, what's the truth or what's the story you're trying to tell? With synthetic uh, databases, you got the dots. So you can control how you aggregate and you control how you map the data. So freedom from tyranny is uh, what I like to call it. So here's every household simulated in Baltimore, uh, color-coded by race. And uh, you can see the large areas in Baltimore are unpopulated. Nobody lives there. Remember that first uh, map I showed with just the white out outlines? It seems like, okay, people live everywhere. They don't. There are large swaths that have no people because of uh, parks, transportation. Uh, guess what this is right here? Johns Hopkins University, um, and, and so on. So it's not evenly distributed, and the fact that we've disaggregated the data to dots means we can do all kinds of interesting geographical uh, analyses on them. So let's change the topic for a minute, and let's do a little geography test. Um, this is uh, Jeopardy. U.S. cities for $1,000, Alex? Okay, let's guess the city just based on this is actually income. Yellow is low, blue is high, but uh, it's really the, the distribution of population. All right. Yell it out. Nobody? Okay, that's Baltimore. Okay. You, you all live here, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, how about this one? New York City. Manhattan is right in the middle here. This is Central Park. Blue is higher income. Yellow is lower income. Hmm. Interesting. A lot of low-income people in the Lower East Side here. Uh, a growing uh, high-income population in Brooklyn. Anyway, uh, what's all this over here? This is the Meadowlands. Nobody lives there. Um, you know, so this is where the people actually live. All right, how about this one? Come on, somebody can guess. Florida. All right. Florida, sorry. Eh. This is San Francisco Bay. All right, so here's San Francisco right up here. Here's Golden Gate Park. This is the bay. This is the uh, Silicon Valley. This is uh, mountains. Okay, another one. We'll go through these quickly here. All right, anybody? Chicago. Chicago. The ones on the coast are easier. Okay, so this one's on a coast even though it's the Great Lakes. This one has an interesting geographical uh, aspect to it. Anybody see it? Three Rivers, Pittsburgh. So we got, uh, what is the Allegheny, the Monongahela, and the Ohio. That's what I get for being so old, I forget my geography. How about this one? Philadelphia. This one I've color coded by age of householder, and the pinks are uh, 55 and older, or even 65 and older. Miami. If you look at Florida with this map, uh, it's mostly pink. Uh, if you look at Manhattan, it's mostly uh, blue. If you look at age, well, it, it varies, but you know, in some in some areas, there's a, just a huge difference in in the age. And and you can see things like this pop out right there. See that golf course community. Once you get into the middle of the country, it's really hard to tell. Like this one, this is Kansas City. I wouldn't have known that either. Um, this is interesting. This is uh, Phoenix. You've got these uh, straight lines in Phoenix where development stops, and that could be because of uh, Indian reservations, it could be, or it could be, uh, not sure. So it's down here you see it, up here you see it. Uh, very, very uh, different levels of uh, uh, heterogeneity in the income. Uh, this, I think, is uh, Kansas City, Indianapolis. They all look the same uh, pretty much after a while. And this is just a random place in the Midwest. The point here is that you've got these little centers of population uh, along major highways. You can definitely see a linear kind of thing here going on. And then you've got little population centers uh, that, that string along here. This is what the whole Midwest looks like. Okay. All right. So back to, uh, back to the 
use of the synthetic populations. The, the point of that was that it's really just very interesting to look at this stuff. And the way you can look at it, by the way, let me show you this uh, very quickly. We have a synthetic population viewer on the web. And uh, so this is a URL that uh, I can provide at the end of the presentation. And you can just go wherever you want to go. And you can zoom in. And you can look at. Um, any of those four variables, like uh, uh, income. You have to zoom in far enough. There's income. There's householder race. There's householder age. Or you can do quad view, where you can see all four at once. So for this area, you get a glimpse. This is uh, Washington of how all four of those variables uh, compare to each other. And you can also turn off the, uh, the background so it's black or white. I spend hours on this uh, myself because I just think it's fascinating. Anyway, the, the data behind this is what's really the key. Now, how do we take uh, the synthetic data and use it for uh, other things or attach additional data? For, so, so for example, the ACS, they don't collect data on behavior, right? But there are a lot of surveys out there that do. So one of those is NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. They collect a lot of uh, information. I mean, there's just tons and tons of questions they ask. But one part of the survey is on uh, food insecurity. And uh, so what we can do is we can take these survey statistics on food insecurity by socio-demographic covariates and estimate the probabilities that a synthetic household will be in a particular in food insecurity uh, category based on its characteristics. So we do that by turning NHANES into a set of probabilities. And, and uh, uh, I'm just highlighting four records. These are four records that all have the same demographics. So it's a, uh, uh, a, a, a householder that's headed by a woman. It's an Asian household. There's two people in it. Their income is high, a value of five is high, and they uh, have high school degrees. So um, uh, food insecurity category one is not insecure. So 75, 74% of the people uh, or the households that have these criteria are going to not be food insecure. And the main thing is because their income is high. We generate these probabilities for every combination of uh, householder, gender, race, number of occupants, income, and educational attainment because those are the covariates that predict food insecurity. And once we've got the probabilities, we just read through our entire synthetic population and we roll the dice on a household that's headed by a woman. Uh, she's Asian. There's two people in the household. They have a high income and high school education. And 75% of the time, that household will be selected to be food insecure. Okay. So we take these probabilities and we assign those uh, characteristics to the synthetic households. And now we've got locations of households by food insecurity. And so. Uh, this map shows that the black dots are only households that are highly food insecure. Okay, so they're category four. Now we can do all kinds of geograph geographical things with this data. And just one example here is we can generate uh, clusters. Are there clusters? Yes. How clustered is the data? Um, uh, you can do all kinds of measures of clustering. And you can take these clusters and uh, compare them uh, the food insecurity to food outlets or food quality or, uh, uh, or anything like that that has a geographical basis. And um, uh, so it's a very, very valuable way to, uh, to assign new uh, data to the synthetic population. And this holds true in, in simulations as well. So if we want to simulate an intervention that tries to uh, improve food insecurity, we can take this behavior and take account of it in the uh, simulation. Uh, how about smoking? Would you like to have a map of smoking risk at a detailed level? Same idea. We take uh, uh, data, I think it's from CDC, I could be wrong, but uh, survey data on who smokes and what are their household characteristics. Same idea. We attach those uh, you smoke or you don't smoke based on your demographics. And then we do a cluster analysis to see in the red areas higher likelihood of, uh, of a higher prevalence of smoking. And then finally, obesity. 
So here is uh, a cluster analysis of obesity risk in Baltimore. Now I'm showing this, it's very preliminary. We haven't looked to see how accurate it is, so that's one of the things we'll be doing. But with this kind of uh, a map, uh, it, it, it allows a lot of new kinds of analyses. Okay, some other applications. Um, Geographic uh, level, we can do things like simulate the effects of sea level rise. So here's a very coastal county in North Carolina. And on the left, over time, as the sea level rises, more and more areas are underwater in yellow. And all we do is we count up the households as each one is engulfed by that uh, synthetic or that uh, estimate of, of flooding. And we can, we can uh, summarize the, the data by uh, income or race uh, or any of the other demographics. I'm just going to run it again here. And we have business data, which we do. We've located all the businesses here. We can see how many businesses are affected here, how many employees might be put out of work, how much lost sales there might be. So again, a very simple way if you have a good uh, sea level rise model of estimating the impacts on population and business. Uh, emergency management is a very nice application of synthetic data because uh, a lot of times uh, uh, emergency management people have to do things like evacuate people. So this map, it's a little hard to see here, but in the center of this is the Sharon Harris uh, nuclear power plant uh, in North Carolina. And every power plant in the U.S., nuclear power plant, has a 10-year evacuation, a 10-mile evacuation zone. And if there's a major accident, uh, one of the things, you know, depending on the severity, is they uh, have to evacuate everybody. Well, the, the emergency management people, A, want to know how many people there are in there. And uh, this uh, shows there are about 52,000 people within that 10 miles. If I use census block groups to do this, I have to cut the block groups into pieces and estimate which piece is inside and outside. It's easy to do in the GIS, but it's just kind of an artificial way of doing it. Having the households is, is uh, easier. But the bottom line of this is that I can select how many households in this area uh, have a head of householder who's over 65, lives alone, and doesn't have a car. Because those are the people the emergency management people are going to have to go get. And there's 165 of them, and there might, might only be five police cars in this county. So it, it's useful as a, as a way of, of, of helping emergency management know what kinds of uh, population issues they're going to have. And then finally, environmental risk. Um, I know we're mostly concerned with uh, uh, public health here. But environmental uses are quite prevalent as well. This shows a simulated plume of uh, a uh, leak from an underground storage tank of gasoline. So it's a gas station where you get a leak. And over 10 or 20 years, that stuff gets out into the groundwater, and it, and it flows uh, in the groundwater. And um, we ran a simulation across the US where we simulated these plumes at 40,000 gas stations. and uh, it's not only the direction of the plume that matters, but it's how close you are to that direction. So along the, the, the flow line here, up in this red area, is a much greater exposure to that chemical. It's in higher concentrations. So if we take our household, synthetic households as dots and we overlay it into this risk map of uh, exposure, um, it's really easy to calculate for this one area the uh, exposure based on the demographics. And because we've taken into account these areas that are not populated, uh, we're not going to estimate any exposure for those. Where if we had a, a block group map, and remember those polygons, I would be assuming that each polygon was, was filled randomly with households all over. It's was, it was homogeneous. It's not the case. Okay, so uh, that's really uh, what I wanted to show. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, uh, Bruce again for the invitation and uh, acknowledge his uh, uh, support and work with us on, on these things. Uh, the synthetic population that we generated at RTI, the nation nationwide uh, data set, was funded by the MIDAS uh, 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 project out of NIGMS. Uh, RTI's uh, PIs are Diane Wagner and Phil Cooley. And uh, staff from uh, several different groups at RTI contributed to that data set. Uh, my group, uh, 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 geospatial people, but also uh, a set of database people and uh, programmers and uh, associated staff at RTI. 
So uh, we have some time left, so I think we can entertain questions if there are any, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. And there's a, there's a microphone thing here. I'm going to take the mic around. Okay. I saw a couple of hands. Okay, we'll start here and then we'll go next here. Thanks very much. Um, I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to apply this in a lower middle income country and what different challenges may be in those settings. Uh, okay, so the question was, well, I guess everybody could hear it, uh, was about uh, different countries, especially low income countries. And we have generated synthetic populations for uh, several countries, India, Thailand, um, Cambodia, uh, uh, Indonesia, and the kind of the, the quality of the of the data depends on the census data that is available in the country. So, for Indonesia, for example, uh, there is data that uh, they provide that is a 10% microdata sample. So, in the U.S., we get that 5% sample. In Indonesia, they have a 10% sample. So, it's a great source. We just kind of scale it up and turn it into synthetic population. But we don't know too much about the local level. So their, their estimates are for very large areas. Basically, a, a whole county would be the area that they estimate, whereas here we have an estimate in a block group. So we can't get very spatially specific about where those households are. We place them based on what we think is the population density, but we don't know if this part of a regency in Indonesia is higher income than this part of the same regency. Okay, so there's, there's good data, we can do a lot with it, there's some limitations in terms of the specificity. Other countries, uh, we, we did do one of China as well, um, and for China we did not have a microdata sample, so we simply took the uh, census data of distributions of households by household size and age and gender, and we created, that's one where we synthesized the households just from scratch, from the, the distributions. And then again, we place them based on other data about uh, population density. But we don't know anything more about those synthetic households and people than age and gender and that they're in a household. So there are, are possibilities but limitations uh, internationally. So Bill, we have peop a lot of people that watch on the webcast and those that are watching live can email in their questions to you. So okay. No? No questions yet from email? Okay. No, it, but it's not posted up there, the address, uh, so the audience knows where the address is. Great. So, yeah, feel okay. free if you're watching live to email it in, and Vincent will give uh, Bill the question. Okay, there's a question over here. This is, this is very, do you hear me? Uh, I assume they've got it all working back there. Go ahead. It looks on. It's okay. Um, this is very exciting. I have two questions, and sorry. If I missed the first. Hello? Okay. Um, in case I missed the first. The, um, I'll repeat the question, so go ahead. Okay. For what years um, do you have the census population that's going to be microdata? And the second question is um, I suppose they come with a table, like a periodical table of household. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So there are two questions there. One was, uh, what are the dates of the source data, basically, of the ACS? Uh, and that data comes from, uh, for the, the current nationwide data, data set that we have is from the 2005 to 2009 ACS. Okay. So it's their five-year uh, sample. It's just that one. Now, we're currently working on a new uh, synthetic population database nationwide that will use the counts from the 2010 census. Okay, so it will match the 2010 census, and it'll use the ACS the, from 2007 to 2011 as the source of the microdata. 
Okay, so that'll be uh, very closely matched to the 2010 census. So that's one we're working on now. But the one that exists is from 2005 to 2009. Uh, now, as far as attaching other attributes to the synthetic population, yes, as I, as I uh, mentioned on one slide, there is a table that has the list of each household and a table that has a list of each person with the latitude, longitude, uh, and the ID of each household is the full state, county, census tract, block group ID, so you can associate any other census data with uh, people be, uh, in the synthetic population because you know exactly which block group uh, the, the ha synthetic households are in. Uh, for survey data, um, it, it, in a way, you asked about the geographic level of the survey. In a way, it doesn't really matter because, like for the, um, uh, the NHANES data that I showed for the food insecurity, that's a national, na reported nationally. So, so they have the, the data on food insecurity from a national sample, and they don't even report it, I don't think. I'm not an expert on NHANES, but they don't report it by state, I don't think, and certainly not by county. Um, but the, at the national estimates, if you know those covariates and the correlation between uh, income, household size, race, and so on, which you can derive from the national NHANES estimates, you make the assumption that those correlations apply to any place that we have synthetic population for. Okay, I see you. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's some issues there. I mean, because there are differences, obviously, in a local area that may not match up with the national estimate. But it's a way to do it. It's a way to get moving in the right direction. I think what will be important when we look at some of those maps that I showed for uh, food insecurity or smoking or obesity is to do some uh, validation and calibration using other data sources. Yep. Any other questions? mentioned the, the, the polygons sort of arbitrarily decided was was there a rhyme or reason and have they changed over the years and and I guess the final question is is there any uh, anticipated changes in the future to to uh, shift them towards a more rational or logical <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, in terms of the census uh, polygons they I, I don't know the full story behind how they define the census geography. I mean, the Census uh, Bureau does that. And they do it both for operational reasons, I think, but also they try to group. They want to have tracks and, you know, be approximately the same size in terms of population. They don't want to have ones that are, you know, have 30,000 people and other that have five people. They, they try to do that. Um, so in rural areas, they're bigger. In urban areas, they're smaller. Um, and I think they try to do it so that they, they have the best shot at showing the spatial heterogeneity of the census. Um, but it, uh, it, it is arbitrary in a way that, I mean, they, def they define them. I mean, they make them. Um, and that's the way we are very used to looking at the data. And fortunately, they have produced the maps, so we can look at the data in a mapping uh, kind of way, because it didn't used to be that way. It, it didn't used to be possible to, to map uh, census data easily, but now you can. Um, they do change. Uh, every 10-year decennial census, uh, they do change the census geography. Um, they do that if, for example, there's an area that has a, a, a huge new housing development with a couple thousand new people that didn't exist 10 years ago, they might take a tract and split it. So now you got two where you had one before. Um, they do occasionally eliminate tracts uh, where there's been areas that have been depopulated. And it's a real struggle to try to take like the 2000 decennial census tracts and map them to the 2010 tracts. I mean, they have cross references um, and you can overlay them, but it's, it's kind of a, it's a real hassle to compare across censuses. Um, and will they change? Yep, they'll change in 2020. But they do st uh, stay sa stable for uh, the 10 years. Yeah. So the ACS is constantly uh, providing new data, but the census geography underlying the ACS doesn't change except every 10 years. I have a question. So when you were talking about um, the assumption of head of household and races applied to the rest of the mm -hmm. household, and as multiracial families are becoming more common, right. 
how do you see that being addressed and, and is it is it anticipated there'll be a critical time period where some new methodology has to be in place? Yeah, to it, that? That, that's a, a, good, a good question about, the, 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 the real issue is that we're selecting households and whatever people are in there come along. Mm -hmm. And so some of the characteristics we want to match on are person level characteristics like race, not household level. And there is research going on uh, in a number of organizations to try to tackle that problem by first um, selecting households and then looking at the person level uh, uh, distribution and doing what is called in this uh, research out of uh, Arizona State, uh, iterative proportional updating, where they actually swap persons in and out to try to do a better match. Let's say of age. That's another thing. You know, we, we may we match on age of householder, but not every person's age. So if it's very, if it's very critical in your model to get the right count of six-year-olds, you know, in our synthetic population, you know, it may not match that closely. So there is work to try to improve the matching at the person level. Um, so, and, and it will be more important. Um, uh, as things like multiracial families uh, become more common. Yeah. Or for certain models that really have to have an extremely good uh, match of uh, person level age. Yeah, Atif? Um, in terms of um, areas with a special needs, in term, for example, long term care facilities or housings that are not necessarily linked to you living there, but you might temporarily right. be there, army bases or anywhere else. Right. How does the synthetic population deal with that? So, uh, so you're talking about group quarters mainly, and uh, group quarters are uh, places uh, where people live, but they're not households. So the main four group quarters types are nursing homes, uh, jails and prisons, military bases and college dormitories. There are other, other ones as well, but those are the four uh, main ones. And I didn't talk about it at all here, but we do create synthetic agents for those four types of group quarters. So we do have another table in our synthetic population that has a location of nursing homes and an estimate of the people in each one by age and gender. We don't have all the other characteristics of those people uh, like, you know, educational attainment and so on, but we do have age and gender. Um, they're, they're not households, you know, they're group quarters, meaning that they, they live in a communal sort of setting. I think one of the definitions in the Census Bureau is uh, how do you get your meals? If you've got a kitchen that is your own kitchen, um, then you're not a group quarters, but in a, in a nursing home, in some college dormitories and jail, you're going to eat together with everybody. And so that's one of the definitions. But anyway, we have made, it, made an attempt to create that synthetic population in group quarters. So we have that. Yeah. Vincent, do you want to see if anybody's emailed in at all? OK. All right. I'll close it up then. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.